Welcome back to another episode of Antique Tags. This episode will serve as part two of the Four Tours series. If you're watching this part two episode, I assume you've already watched part one. If not, please go back and check that one out first because it covers some important details that you'll need to know to better understand this episode. So without further ado, let's begin. The design of the second generation may not have been as radical for its time, especially when compared to the first generation. Ford took the bold design of the first generation and evolved it into something more streamlined for the American market. Regardless of the design, buyers came in droves to purchase the new for 1992 Ford Taurus, which eventually edged out the Honda Accord and took the crown as the best-selling car in America for its entire production run. In this episode, we're going to take a deeper look at the second generation 1992 to 1995 Ford Taurus and how it was arguably Ford's most successful Taurus generation. So grab a cup of coffee, kick back, and let's get down to the nitty gritty. The first generation Ford Taurus went on sale in 1985 as a 1986 model riding on the Delta November 5 platform and eventually replacing the rear-wheel drive midsize LTD, which rode on an extended version of the Fox platform. Being available in four trim levels, L, MT5, GL, and LX, the new for 1986 Taurus was a major departure from the typical offerings produced by Detroit at the time. A 2.5-liter HSC four-cylinder was available on certain trim levels, which was good for 90 horsepower. The 3 liter Vulcan V6 was optional on lower trims and standard on higher trim levels, cranking out 140 horsepower. Ford's 3.8 liter Essex V6 would later augment the engine lineup, becoming the premium engine option. The Essex generated the same horsepower figures as the Vulcan, but yielded more torque. In almost an instant, the first generation Taurus became wildly successful, selling over 200,000 units within the 1986 model year. The 8th generation Lincoln Continental will also share its unibody chassis with the Ford Taurus and Mercury Sable, while getting its own unique exterior and interior design language and riding on a 3 inch longer wheelbase. As early as 1987, a second generation replacement was already in the initial stages. Other car manufacturers had taken notice of the success Ford had with its new for 1986 sedan. And of course, Ford wanted to keep its momentum going, as well as remain ahead of the competition. When the first generation Taurus went on sale, it poached many sales from contemporary mid-size offerings of the domestic and foreign markets, forcing these rivals to make their mid-size sedans even more competitive. With all that being said, in order for the Taurus to remain a sales leader, it was imperative for it to remain ahead of the pack, so the design work on a successor had gotten underway. 1988, the final design for the second generation Taurus was submitted and approved. If you watched part one of our Ford Taurus episode, you can recall us mentioning Jack Telnack. Jack Telnack at the time was the global vice president of design of the Ford Motor Company. He had his hands in the design process of the Fox Body Mustang, not to mention the first generation Taurus. The eighth generation Continental that we mentioned earlier was also overseen by Telnack. These were just a few models he was responsible for. Jack Telnack, accompanied by his team, would be responsible for the design process of the second generation Taurus as well which was a good thing. The first gen Taurus sold itself based solely on its design and Ford was looking to recapture the success with this new second generation model. The idea for the second generation Taurus was for it to retain most of its overall design language while being completely new. So in other words, although it would be a redesigned sedan, it wouldn't be mistaken for anything but a Taurus. Ford wanted this new model's design to be evolutionary, not revolutionary. Since Telnac's first iteration of the Taurus proved to be a hit, Ford didn't want to alienate its prospective buyers by offering a radically different design for the second generation model. Along with the new design, it will offer new and improved features 
in an attempt to not only outclass the rival brands, but to also remain the sales leader it had become in an increasingly competitive mid-sized segment. During this same year, 1988, the redesign for the Mercury counterpart was in the works as well. This new second generation Sable will also retain the overall design language of its predecessor and share its mechanical parts with the Taurus. The redesigned sedans were planned to enter production in the early part of the following decade. By the following year, 1989, the millionth first generation Taurus was sold. This was also the same model year that brought out the Taurus SHO, the performance sedan that sported the Yamaha built V6 paired with a Mazda designed manual gearbox. The SHO was well received amongst the general public and proved successful. Therefore, plans of a second generation had got the green light for this model as well. 1991. This marked the final model year of the first generation Taurus and Sable. 1991 also spelled the end of the wimpy 90 horsepower 2.5 liter four cylinder, which was dropped from the lineup. The MT5 sedan was aimed at Japanese imports. However, that particular trim proved to be slow selling, so it was dropped back in 1988. So, the Taurus line continued to offer the L, GL, and LX trim levels. In the month of July, production of the first generation Taurus had ceased in preparation of the upcoming second generation model. The first generation Taurus proved to be a major success, and by the time production ended in July of 91, over 2 million units had been sold. Atlanta Assembly and Chicago Assembly had shifted production and scheduled the new second generation cars to begin assembly in August. 1992. This marked the first model year for the second generation Ford Taurus and Mercury Sable. The cars went on sale in fall 1991 for the 1992 model year. On the outside, the newly redesigned second generation Taurus grew in length over its predecessor by a few inches. Continuing the use of the Delta November 5 platform, the redesign tacked on a few hundred extra pounds. However, the new car compensated itself with improved aerodynamics. With the exception of the doors, all of the exterior body panels were significantly revamped. Up front, the fascia kept its bottom breather grille opening that was previously incorporated into the design of the first generation model. The headlamps had a similar arrangement as the previous generation, although this time around they were much slimmer. Overall, this new front end was more aerodynamically efficient than the outgoing Taurus. Looking at the rear end, we will notice newly designed tail lamps, although they look very much like the ones on the first generation model. Despite the similar appearance, the entire rear clip was fresh for the 1992 model year. On the inside, the interior was mostly all new. We'll get to that mostly part in a bit. Much of the layout was just like that of the first generation, being user friendly and having everything laid out within reach of the driver. We mentioned in part one of this video how the first generation implemented controls that were designed to be recognized by touch and for the driver to use them without taking his or her eyes off the road. The second generation was no different. With safety being a priority, it offered the same type of controls that were designed to be similar to Braille. Speaking of safety, the redesigned dash also incorporated a passenger side airbag, which at the time was unusual for cars of this class to have. The airbag was optional in early models and became standard in 1993 making the Taurus the first car of its kind to have dual front airbags. The newly redesigned Taurus didn't have an interior that was as configurable as the first generation model. A lot of features that had been available for the previous generation Taurus had gotten the axe by 1992. For instance, the new generation had only one seat design regardless of trim level. The previous generation, on the other hand, the LX, sported its very own exclusive seat design. The two configurations were a front bench seat and a column shifter, or front bucket seats and a center console with a floor shifter. Speaking of the console, that was actually a carryover from the first generation. However, it would eventually be redesigned for the following 1993 model year. The radio was redesigned, 
However, the rest of the lower dash was also carried over from the prior generation. This was also the case with the steering wheel, another component from the first generation. These components that were carried over is the reason we mentioned the interior being mostly redesigned. However, to the typical buyer, this was mostly unnoticed. A sable only feature for 1992 was the strip of wood grain dash trim on non-passenger airbag equipped models. The wood grain dash was ditched for the 1993 model year once a passenger side airbag was made standard across the board. With this new generation, the familiar trim levels returned to the lineup. The base model L, the mid-range GL, and the highest trim level, the LX. Each trim level for the 1992 model year had its own distinguishing features. For instance, the L model sported light gray plastic mirrors and window trim, and the bumpers and side trim were light gray in color as well. The GL came with chrome window trim and body color mirrors. However, it kept the gray bumpers and side trim. The LX had body color bumpers and also sported body color side cladding. For the 1992 model year, L and GL trim levels could also be specced with a two-tone paint job. So rather than being gray in color, the bumpers and side trim could be painted a slightly darker shade of the car's body color as an option. This option was also available for the Sable GS models, but in an attempt to reduce costs, all of this went away for the 1993 model year, and all second generation models got color matched trim and bumpers for the rest of its production. The L trim level itself also went away after the 1992 model year due to lagging sales. This ultimately positioned the GL as the base model. All in all, much of the exterior resembled that of the first generation. Because of this, many prospective buyers were convinced the new Taurus was merely a facelift of the first generation and not a thorough redesign. Despite these false beliefs, the second generation Taurus was well received just as much, if not more, than its first iteration. As we mentioned earlier, Ford didn't want to alienate any of its prospective buyers. Thus, it carefully redesigned its popular midsize sedan. Nevertheless, the careful redesign paid off, with over 400,000 second generation cars being sold just within its initial 1992 model year. The second generation Sable targeted a more affluent demographic, going on sale in conjunction with the Taurus in late 1991. Mechanically, the Sable shared all of its components with its Taurus counterpart, while sporting its very own exclusive exterior and interior, just like the first generation. Speaking of the first generation, the new for 1992 Sable resembled it very much, despite the interior and exterior being almost completely redesigned. The light bar theme remained, although this time, it was much slimmer. The overall silhouette echoed that of the original, the inconspicuous grille, and the form of vertical slats returned. By now, much of the Mercury lineup had gotten the Sable-inspired light bar treatment. There were a few exceptions, such as the Capri, Cougar, and the Grand Marquis. And honestly, it's probably a good thing those particular models did not get the light bar treatment. Other brands were also used in the light bar on their own models, such as the Pontiac Grand Prix sedan. Just like the Taurus, the new second-gen Sable returned with its familiar trim levels. In part one of this video, we mentioned the Sable being offered in GS and LS trim levels. The 1992 model offered the same trim levels for its sedan and wagon models. The Sable LTS eventually came to fruition. More on that later. If you've been following along, you can recall us mentioning the 2.5 liter inline 4 being dropped in early 1991, as well as the ATX automatic transmission. That said, all second generation models came with only V6 engines. The 3 liter Vulcan V6 that cranked out 140 horsepower was standard equipment. The LX Wagon came standard with the 3.8 liter SX V6. The Essex engine was optional on all other Taurus variants. The engines in this generation were mated to a 4-speed automatic transmission. 
Before 1993, it was replaced with a newly renamed transmission that has some modifications such as improvements in the lubrication of the gear set and capacity upgrades as well as the introduction of high energy friction materials. This particular transmission was used for the rest of the generation's production run in most models. The second generation Taurus went on to become the best selling car in the United States, beating the likes of the Camry and the Cord, not to mention other contemporary midsize offerings. 1995 marked the final model year of the second generation Taurus, and although the second generation had a relatively short four year production run, more than 1.5 million sedans and wagons were produced. This all goes without saying, the Taurus posed as a significant threat to foreign and domestic rivals. Consequently, it posed a significant threat to other Ford models as well. Needless to say, being in competition with other Ford sedans definitely was not part of the plan. For instance, during this time, the new for 1995 Ford Contour was on sale in Ford showrooms. It targeted a completely different demographic than the Taurus. There were large factory incentives being offered on the outgoing second generation Taurus, an expectation for the all new third generation model that was going to be on sale late 1995 for the 1996 model year. Prospective Contour buyers felt as though the incentives offered for the 1995 Taurus made it a better value for the money. Ultimately, this mentality cannibalized some of the Contour sales. However, even without the incentives, the intended demographic in the Contour's price range were still more interested in the larger Taurus, especially since a base model Taurus GL was still somewhat well equipped and was somewhere in the price vicinity of a specked out Contour. Ford wanted to rectify this in-house competition by pushing the third generation Taurus further upmarket, which would create a price gap pushing it further from the Contour, thus keeping the two cars further separated. The third generation Taurus rolled off the assembly line in mid-July 1995 at the Chicago assembly plant. The new cars showed up in showrooms in September of that year and went on sale soon thereafter in October 1995. When the third generation went on sale, it was more luxurious and pushed further upmarket as Ford originally intended. The styling of the 1996 Taurus was a far cry from the 1995 model but Ford wanted to test out a new radical design language to continue the success it enjoyed with the first generation model, which was also considered radical by mid 1980 standards. So really, Ford wanted to use the same formula it did with the 1986 Taurus. The 1986 Taurus was different for its time. The executives at Ford, not to mention other auto manufacturers, were pretty much convinced the 1986 Taurus would be an epic failure since it was such a huge departure from the contemporary mid-size sedans American buyers had grown accustomed to. Of course, the execs were all proved wrong when over 1 million of the Taurus sedans were sold by its fourth model year. The 1996 Taurus was built on that same philosophy. Ford was certain that creating another radical design for the Taurus would be a repeat of the same success that happened back in 1986. But we'll discuss the third generation Taurus more in detail in another video. There was a modified police package available for the second generation Taurus. Many are unaware of this, mainly because so few were sold and actually seen on the road. The police package was simply a Taurus GL that sported a modified Essex V6. The output of this police package engine increased by 15 horsepower thanks to the addition of a dual exhaust muffler system similar to that on the SHO. Another mod included a larger fuel tank along with stainless steel brake lines, standard four-wheel disc brakes with ABS, a modified front grille that allowed for increased airflow to the radiator, and a certified calibration 140 miles per hour speedometer. Despite all these modifications, law enforcement agencies never favored the Taurus version more than the Crown Victoria, which outsold the Taurus by a long shot. When the first generation Taurus SHO went on sale, it was slated for only one or two years of production. 
Ford didn't hide the fact that the SHO's 3 liter mill was designed and developed by Yamaha. The company used that bragging right as a marketing tool. Nominally based on the standard Taurus 3 liter power plant, the two engines shared the same 60 degree cylinder bank angle, 89 millimeter bore, 80 millimeter stroke, and little else. By 1989 standards, the SHO's dual overhead cam aluminum cylinder heads and exposed intake runners were both striking and far flung, generating 220 horsepower and 200 pound feet of torque. The engine could reportedly rev to 8500 RPM, but was limited to a red line of 7300. The SHO was a huge knockout, selling more than 15,000 units. That may not sound like much, especially when compared to the standard Taurus, but the 15,000 annual units was a much higher number than originally projected. Ford realized the general populace appreciated a mainstream, American-built performance-oriented sedan, so they went ahead and approved the SHO for a second generation. The second generation Taurus SHO went on sale in late 1991, alongside the standard Taurus. It continued with the same powertrain from the previous model, however this time around, the SHO was more clean cut without the aggressive body cladding of the previous generation. It even sported its own unique front end to distinguish itself from the standard Taurus. And if you guessed those headlights were derived from the Sable, you're right. The unique front end was mainly due to a common complaint of the previous generation SHO. Customers griped that although the SHO had a unique powertrain, it was still almost visually identical to the standard Taurus sedan. Up front, the new second generation car wouldn't be mistaken for anything other than an SHO. And although it shared the Sable's hood, fenders, and headlamps, it had its own unique bumper, fog lamps, and it lacked the middle light bar. Therefore, no one could mistake it for a Mercury. Looking at the rear of the car, the SHO got a dual exhaust and its very own rear bumper. The initial SHOs can be distinguished by visual elements, such as the lack of a rear spoiler and downturned exhaust tips. 1993 SHOs had their rear brakes converted to solid discs, which replaced the vented discs that were used on all prior SHOs. The 1993 SHOs also got a slightly revised interior, in particular, an updated center console, just like the standard Taurus. This model year also got the spoiler and the directional slicer wheels. As a way of attracting even more buyers, Ford also offered an automatic in the SHO for the first time. Going back to the first generation, the SHO had many prospective buyers, but a lot of them simply didn't know how to drive a stick shift. Ford realized that although first-gen SHO sales were great, it could have been even better had they offered an automatic in conjunction with the Mazda design 5-speed manual. The new automatic SHO was mated to a 3.2-liter version of the 3-liter engine. The 3.2 cranked out an identical 220 horsepower just like the 3-liter, however it produced additional torque. Word on the street is that Ford installed a less aggressive cam in the 3.2 liter motor to keep the horsepower figures parallel with that of the 3 liter motor in the automatic car. For buyers that liked the SHO but didn't want to pony up the extra cash for one, Ford augmented a new trim level to the Taurus line, the SE. Showing up for the 1995 model year, the new SE was intended to be a budget-friendly, sporty variant of the standard Taurus. It was positioned between the base model GL and the top trim LX. This was supposed to be a sporty model, so it came equipped with front bucket seats and a center console. A floor-mounted shifter was also standard. The rear spoiler of the Taurus SE was derived from the SHO. The SE trim only applied to the sedans, not the wagons. We mentioned in part one of this video how Ford intended on producing a modified Sable variant for the 1989 model year, dubbed the Sable LTS, which would have served as a counterpart to the Taurus SHO. And we also mentioned how the execs at Ford thought the Sable LTS was a good idea, but ended up scrapping it after realizing the potential for in-house competition with the SHO. 
The LTS name eventually came to fruition, augmenting the Sable lineup for the 1995 model year. But it was simply positioned as the top trim level for the Sable and did not serve as a high performance counterpart to the Taurus SHO. However, there was a Sable that ran the SHO's engine. The Mercury Sable AIV was produced running an SHO derived 220 horsepower 3.2 liter V6. Being mostly engineered and tested in Canada, AIV was short for Aluminum Intensive Vehicle, and it was an early experimental use of an all aluminum body car. Aluminum parts were not uncommon on cars in the early 90s, but they were used primarily in the engine, for the wheels, or for air conditioning components. This car, on the other hand, was developed using aluminum suspension elements and aluminum body panels being held together with a spot welding process and adhesive joining process specifically developed just for its very own usage. Because of these lighter materials, the Sable AIV had a huge drop in weight, making it more efficient than a standard Sable or Taurus for that matter. But going back to the SHO's engine, developers chose this engine not only because of speed and power, but also because of the construction of the engine. Yamaha definitely shines in their ability to craft an aluminum engine. And let's keep in mind, the SHO 3.2 liter V6 utilizes an aluminum cylinder head, while the standard Vulcan V6 is iron. The huge shed and weight combined with the 220 horsepower engine made this the fastest stock second generation Sable ever built. As evidence of its speed, one of the AIV Sables finished a respectable 15th in the 1995 One Lap of America, ahead of Mustang Cobras, Corvettes, not to mention Porsches. But there was a catch to all of this, and that's the fact this car was never intended for production in mass numbers, like the standard Sable. Only a small number of these cars were ever built. They were never sold, and there were a few survivors that stuck around. A point of contact at Ford's Canadian headquarters mentioned that these cars are unable to be registered at the DMV as road going vehicles. Therefore, the ones left over will likely be scrapped. Now, let's go back to the standard second generation Ford Taurus and take a closer look at exactly how it was crowned the best selling car for its entire production run. As mentioned, the Ford Taurus debuted for the 1986 model year, and although Ford sold a tremendous amount of the original Taurus, it never held the title of being the best-selling car in the United States. A ton of the first generations were sold. This led many to falsely believe the Taurus was already the best-selling car when it debuted back in the 1980s, but that was not the case. For instance, the Chevy Celebrity was the best-selling car for the 1986 model year, with a tick above 408,000 units being sold. The following model year, 1987, Ford's own Escort achieved that milestone. This was the second time the Escort became the best-selling car in the United States, with the first time being the 1982 model year. The 1987 Escort sold over 390,000 units although the 1987 Taurus was right behind it in sales. Fast forward to 1988 and the Escort retains the best selling car title for this model year as well, the second year in a row and the second year in which it edged out the Taurus for the top spot. The third generation Honda Accord, the ones with the pop-up headlamps, earned the status of the best selling car in the US for the 1989 model year. For 1990, the newly redesigned 4th generation Accord laid claim to the title, and although the Taurus was in second place to this new Accord, it outsold the Taurus by more than 100,000 units. The Accord took a slight dip in sales for 1991, but it still remained the best selling car in the United States. But everything changed for 1992, following the release of the second generation Taurus. The car was a major hit, selling nearly 410,000 units for its initial model year. With the exception of the 1990 Honda Accord, this new 1992 Taurus outsold every other car we just mentioned on this best-selling car list. The Taurus remained victorious in 1993, once again beating the Accord in terms of sales. 
1994 saw a revised accord, but the Taurus still remained the best seller. For 1995, the second generation Taurus was nearing the end of its production run, but despite sales dropping, it still continued its streak being the best selling car. That made it the best selling car four years in a row. The car earned a great reputation, but along with being popular with the general public, the Taurus got plenty of help from rental companies and fleet buyers, which nevertheless boosted sales. Although it didn't come as close to selling the nearly 400,000 units per year like the Taurus did, the Sable still managed to sell between 110 and 140,000 units annually for the entire duration of its second generation. And believe it or not, those were actually staggering numbers for Mercury, a brand that never sold anywhere close to the volume of its contemporary rivals. But despite the staggering sales numbers, the second generation Taurus and Sables are becoming rather uncommon on the road these days, especially when we take into consideration that both cars combined equaled out to roughly 2 million units being sold from the early to mid 1990s. Nevertheless, the second generation Taurus will go down in history as the best selling car in the United States for its entire production run. A design that was well received by the populace, excellent versatility, and a plethora of features were the ideal recipe to make this second generation car the pinnacle of success that the succeeding generations aspire to be. It was an example of a domestic auto manufacturer taking the right steps and making a competent mid-size sedan capable of competing in the same category as the highly regarded Camry and Accord. This concludes part two of the Ford Taurus series. There will be a part three where we will take a deeper look into the third generation Taurus and Sable. As always, thanks for coming out to the show and we look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Until next time, this is your host Rob and thanks for tuning in to Antique Tags.